recorded live from the secret underground lair of Crimson Cowl Comics and Collectibles, this is the Crimson Cowl Comic Club Podcast. The following issues may contain spoilers. Let's go grocery shopping. I'm Anthony. I'm Kirby. I'm Katie. I'm Eric. Welcome to issue number 295 of the Crimson Cowl Comic Club podcast. Every time we record, we talk about comic books. We won't have a club discussion this week, but we have a very healthy round of weekly reviews. That's where we go back and forth and we talk about the books that we've been reading, whether they're new, whether they're old, we're going to talk about them there. And then we're going to have a new segment. It's going to be part one of two of our previews previews. That's where we jump into the previews catalogs that we get from the comic shops. We look at through our online retailers and we uh, make a list of the books we're excited about. This will be for the March 2024 catalogs uh, for products coming out in uh, May and beyond. So that is going to be the setup. We're going to do Marvel and DC this week, and our next available episode uh, will be part two with the giant previews catalog with the independent publishers, the apparel, the merchandise, the collectibles, all of that fun stuff. So that is going to be the lineup for our show. So let's kick it over to the weekly reviews. First up for the weekly reviews is something very special. Um, there is somebody who myself and Kirby is uh, friends with online, Kevin Wolf. He had uh, put out on his Happy Wolf Art One Instagram page and uh, kind of talking about these kind of uh, these these preview copies, these kind of you know uh, mini comics that he's been doing. And we are going to be talking about to fight a Hessian. And to fight a Hessian, uh, this is a comic and prose story about Kevin and Eddie, who are young kids in school who have conflict with each other. Uh, both come from different society classes. Uh, Kevin being a surfer kid, Eddie being a metalhead, a.k.a. a Hessian. Now, this is something that uh, we got in the mail a couple weeks back. I know Kirby had uh, done an unboxing as well as some cool art from Kevin Wolf, who is the creator of this. And uh, also did a review video for To Fight a Hessian. So check out Under the Call of MS for even more um, reviews on that. But I finally got around to uh, reading these. And both of these here is the comic and a short story. Now, I read the comic first, and I'm pretty sure Kirby read the short story first. Uh, the short story is uh, a prose version. Um, having read both of them, uh, I'm one of those that, like, if I see a movie in the theaters before reading the book, I'm not one of those that say like, I have to read the book first. I like the idea of like, Hey, if I like the movie, I get excited for the book. Cause sometimes I'll just go like right to target by the novel. I'm like, Oh, now I'm just getting like even more into the world of the movie I just saw. So I think, it, you know, I I'm pretty happy with either order that you read it in. Um, but we have the comic version and a pro story version. So we're just going to kind of lightly talk about this here. I really dug it. Uh, this is a story, um, you know, essentially about bullying, talking about uh, Kevin here, who is our surfer kid. And we have Eddie, uh, who is the uh, the metalhead, the uh, what do they call him? The dirt. Uh, what is it? At, uh, where is it? Da, 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 I think it's right on the top here. Yep, I thought it was right on the first page, but I forget it's... the other word that they use for it. So, um... yeah, it's, it's dirt, dirt head. Dirt head, something. Yep. Okay. Hessian and dirt head are the two names they use for them. Okay. Yep. There it is. Yep. I see you now. So, wh what's cool about this, and Kirby talked about it in his video, just kind of talking about the style of this. And I really dug it too, because at first I'm like, okay, what's going on here? But I think Kevin Wolf does a really good job of kind of letting the the flow of the art and the text and the boxes and kind of breaking the mold of your traditional comic panels and uh, kind of just having this kind of art out in the open, if you will. Um, I think it does a really good job of uh, your eye flows to the next part uh, pretty, pretty nicely. Um, so yeah, this is a, a short story comic book. So I'm not going to show and talk about too much off of there. Um, but yeah, this was, this was really cool. I like the concept of it and uh, you'll get, in the comic version, you get 
a lot of art notes. You get, you know, behind the scenes stories. You get, there's just a lot of details that went into this, what, eight or 10 page comic, I think it is. And, um, and well, that's a good 20 pages, 20. <laughs> yeah, with all the bonus stuff, and then you're getting all the roughs and everything. So the stuff I just showed you, you're also getting like kind of like the rough draft mode of it. So you're just getting everything all in one. And I thought it was a pretty cool presentation, just kind of showing the uh, the differences of this Kevin, who is uh, the surfer kid, and he's being picked on. And in, in return, he also has insults for his bully. And ultimately, it's just kind of a, a story of uh, how they confront and basically living up to your actions and the words and the consequences that come with it. And uh, it's a real funny story seeing kind of Kevin sort of dodge his bully knowing that uh this bully's gonna meet him at the house and uh you know the i made the mention of the grocery shopping because that plays into effect where he's just like oh i'll just go you know go to the grocery store with my mom as she's going and that'll kill some time and surely the bully eddie is not going to be there anymore and then you know you have to read the comic and find out but um and i know kirby also mentioned too that you know, it's 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 a pretty equal size bullying when it comes to like it's not just one sided because you see a lot of uh, insults that are hurled back at uh, Eddie as well. But I thought it was really fun. There's some good like uh, out of body moments in here where you just it's you know things of being like oh this is how it should have happened in a way, but then it's like hey, actually this is how it actually went down. So there's some cool moments there that lets uh, Kevin get to play with his art in the story. Uh, the prose version expanding on that uh, greatly and it's just great just getting these uh, you know mini chapters on you know expanding on the the single pages that we got so yeah there's just a lot of really good stuff here and I kind of like how that was uh, two separate pieces that can be in enjoyed independently but also can be enjoyed back to back and one doesn't really you know negate the other where it's like all right i already read the pros why would i want this or vice versa uh, i think got both uh got a lot out of both so that's my quick little take on that is there anything you want to add in addition to the videos you've done yeah i love I and mean, you can check out my videos see my overall reviews but i like i'd say if you do do get your hands on this it's nice to read the comic first just to get the basic storyline and stuff like that and then the prose were version takes you a little deeper into the history of the story and everything it gives you the a little bit more to it which is nice to clean it up for you but yeah it's fun seeing a person's view that's being bullied but yet you kind of feel like he's bullying too so it's like, it, i like the way it just works out and i gave kevin a hard time because i was the hessian character when i was a kid and he was a surfer character but in wisconsin we're not like that. We don't just go around picking on everybody. We more or less picked on other schools instead of picking on people in our own schools. So, but yeah, he did an awesome job with this. We got to watch him do his art for this prehand pre before this came out and wasn't sure where he was going with it. I figured he was working on a comic. And then when he put this out himself, I'm like, eh, that's awesome. I want to, I like the way he did it. And it came out. It's nice. It's a definitely a quality book for its size and everything. Definitely worth checking out if you're into that style storyline. Yeah, and uh, Kevin Wolf is someone who we would uh, become friends with through the Oh Yeah Comics community. You know, he'd be there on our Balthazar's videos and, you know, all of the Oh Yeah Comics videos and stuff like that. So, and then he's also a frequent uh commenter and viewer for cartoonist by night so he's been kind of in our circles he's been uh promoting under the color of ms he did an awesome drawing uh a mashup of beetle bailey and uh and man thing uh which is on under the color of ms uh, on the youtube channel and everything so there's a lot of a lot of cool stuff and uh so yeah you can check out happy wolf art one there's underscores in between that over on uh, instagram and uh, he has information for a Teespring shop uh, for the video. I'll put that information up here. Otherwise, just search it out. It's kind of a longer address there, but uh, I'm putting it up on the video here. And then also Happy Wolf Art over on YouTube. So 
Once again, if you're watching the video version, you get all the information right there. If you're just listening to us on audio, I just said all that stuff there for you to uh, check it out because it's fun stuff. Reach out to him. Not sure how many of these he made and, uh, you know, other things that are in the works. But uh, I think when he uh, next thing that he kind of works on, you know, we'll have to uh, extend an invite to get him over uh, over here on Crimson Call and have him uh, promote his work. So that is yep. to fight, fight a Hessian, a comic and a pro story from Kevin Wolf. Yeah, from the way Kevin. it sounds, he's already working on another book, so. Yeah, I don't know. He's got, uh, what, like the California Kids is something that seems like it's been like a bigger project in the works. And I've been going through his YouTube videos and he's got some, uh, I think he just has some other pros work and stuff like Amazon Kindle, like releases and stuff like that. So there's a lot of stuff to this mysterious wolf. So, so that was one Kevin. Let's go to the other Kevin, a.k.a. Kirby. What you got? All right. I got issues one to three of Vampire's. The Eternal. This is by Xenoscope. It's part of the Unleashed mini series that they had running. No, <laughs> I always forget that I gotta wear glasses when I read. <laughs> it is widely assumed that fairy tales and monster stories are fiction passed down from generation to generation. However, that is not entirely true. Beings from four different realms linked to Earth, do in fact exist. These realms are known as Mist, Neverland, Wonderland, and Oz. For hundreds of years, monsters have been banished from the Earth. Vampires, werewolves, demons, and zombies were all trapped inside of a hellish prison called the Shadowlands. But that prison has now been opened by a mysterious being. As these nightmarish creatures descend on Earth, four time lost monster hunters for time lost monster hunters must fight for the fate of humanity this is their story when samira the queen of all vampires returns to earth after over a century of banishment she rallies her troops in a mission to kill every monster and highborn who won't bow before her and helsing daughter of the famed vampire hunter himself send Samira back to the grave before the world is enslaved. This is an interesting uh, piece to a variety of storylines, a whole uh, Xenoscope story run that they did during this period. And uh, we basically get a group of highborns, creatures that go around, vampires and stuff like that. And they're basically just causing their havoc, working for her, doing what, whatever she wants done. And at while they're just in the early days, they come across the Black Plague and they find a daughter that just lost her mother and she's about to die too. But one of the vampires takes to her and decides to, decides to bite her and turn her as everybody else walks away. And eventually she comes back to the Full, and she ends up being our evil, evil one that's controlling everything and trying to wipe out all the creatures coming through these realms and stuff. She has a whole organization that's working on it and stuff. And the thing I really like about this is how they combine the creatures throughout the stories. I love the werewolves working with the different characters. I love the artwork that they have. For those creatures, they, I mean, she is controlling it all, basically, as the higher form, but yet the, it seems like the wolves and the vampires do have their separate powers, and I don't know where it's going to go throughout the whole branch of the storyline, because... The way this is laid out is apparently there's like Hunters, the Shadowlands is the jumps in after the basic Unleashed storyline and then the Vampires, the Eternal. Then the Demons come out, then the Werewolves get their thing and then the Zombies. So I'm going to have to eventually find the other characters' storylines to see how this all connected. But I really liked how they did combine the characters together 
and how they're working together and how this is all playing out. And then you get a back history with our Liesl Van Helsing character in the back of every issue. It just goes into her dealing with uh, another type of slayer and they're off in a whole different time period and it's somehow going to link together but we do come across some different different demon hunters and stuff that I've never seen before that end up working for or against Van Helsing and it's just I like the the way they combine this all to make it work I just got to figure out how to get the rest of the books and then get the whole story put together but for some of the things where they just go crazy with so many different offshoots I like how this is basically based in four or five different runs of like four to six comics so it's not overwhelming if you do want to get into it like a DC or Marvel event can be and stuff so but yeah this is an interesting look it gives you I mean the Van Helsing character is drawn completely different in here it has she says more of a young feel to her I didn't like that that kind of kind of just pulls me away from that character because she is well-worn she's been through tons of stuff she's got scars and she's an older lady and stuff and this just made it look like she was kind of gave it that manga feel to her give her that younger look and all that but yeah other than that it was really good all right we are gonna jump over to katie what you got for us all right, this week I'm bringing something a little different. It's another volume of Spy Family, or Spy X Family, if you like. It's Family Portrait. This is a novella um, that has four short stories in it, and it kind of has a floating timeline. It doesn't specifically say where it is in the series, but um, 10 volumes are out now, and uh, volume 11 is going to be out in just two weeks. So I'd say we could assume it's you know somewhere in the middle of the story. Um, like I said, it has four short stories in here. The first one, um, Anya is going on a school trip and uh, she and Damien Desmond, her rival and sometimes friend, uh, get into trouble and some hijinks and it's it's very funny and sweet and um, I, I thought that was really good. And then the second story was about Yuri, um, yours younger brother. Yuri works for the secret police and he is very good at his job of being an interrogator. Well, he gets to um, babysit Anya for the day and they go to like a children's museum type thing where um, basically the kids can like role play through different careers and stuff. Well, of course, Anya, um, she loves watching her Bond Man TV show with spies and interrogators and good guys and bad guys and all that. So she wants to um, role play being a police officer and takes it very, very seriously um, and does an excellent job of and, and intimidating the bad guy and the witness who in truth is really just an actor. And that leads to some bonding between uh, Yuri and Anya. And it's, it's pretty funny overall. Um, and then the third story I thought was really good, but very sad. It was about Frankie, who um, is Lloyd's uh, business associate and friend. And Frankie, um, he's kind of just like a nerdy, nerdy guy um, who I think is actually really quite sweet, but he has a very low opinion of himself and his looks. And he um, ends up meeting a new lady who is blind, but she's an opera singer. And, you know, they they have a really incredible friendship and it seems like it could be something more. And she says, you know, after I have this operation, like, you know, will you be there for me? And uh, Frankie kind of panics because he's like, you know, she's so talented and incredible and she has this amazing family. You know, why would she want to have any kind of connection to, you know, me? And it was pretty sad. And he ends up asking Lloyd for a disguise to kind of help him like fake her out and at first it seems like he's gonna like pretend to be this totally different person and mislead her in this relationship but what he ends up doing is using this um disguise to 
break up with her and basically be like, hey, you know, like, I wish you well with your life. And, you know, I, I really enjoyed meeting you and I can't wait to hear your records someday, um, which I thought was really good character development. And to me, it, it shows that Frankie is actually a good person worthy of love and friendship um because remembering that the character was blind when they met so she wouldn't know what he looks like so if she ever meets him as him in the future she wouldn't realize it was him um so a little sad but still kind of keeping in the spirit of spy family and then the final story is the longest one in the book and your anya and lloyd uh go out for the day to the park and they end up getting approached by an artist who asks to paint their family portrait now, it sounds like super cute and sweet and everything, but when you have a, a mom who's an assassin and a dad who's a spy, you probably don't want your picture painted by uh, what turns out to be a very famous artist and exhibited and stuff. So they do all kinds of goofy things to make sure that their appearance uh, is is altered and doesn't doesn't look like them. Anya, of course, is thrilled. She loves all of this. Um, and in the end, they they do get a a nice but different than what they expected family portrait taken. And even Bond gets to be in it, too. I love that big, fluffy, goofy dog. Um, yeah, I was kind of unsure about this one. So I come to comics from novels, so I'm well used to reading books. But I was like, you know, is this going to translate well? Is this going to be like a useful um a useful adaptation of the story and I actually feel like it really was I felt like I definitely got something out of all of these they were all in the spirit of the manga I'm not quite sure why they weren't adapted into the manga if it was just due to like you know scheduling and you know the artists you know career demands and stuff or if this is like um, a thing that Shonen Jump does every once in a while like put out some short stories for prose readers um that was it was pretty cool and I really did enjoy it. I will say I saw it at Walmart the other week, so um, I like that it's accessible to the masses. That's one concern I have with Western comic books is they're usually sold at specialty stores or you need to like know where to get them online versus most everyone in the states has access to a Walmart. So um, I thought that was cool. I will say if you're a manga only reader, if you want to skip this. I don't think you will not be able to enjoy the story going forward, but I do feel like it's accessible to people who are primarily manga readers and then it, it does add something to it, but it's not essential. And if you are a, a prose reader who doesn't normally read manga, uh, this might be skippable, but I still think you would enjoy it. You know, maybe you've um, seen the TV show on Hulu or, you know, you are interested in it because your friend or family member is, um, I still think you would find this valuable and fun. And it, it's like 175 pages. I read it all last night. It's not long or hard. So it won't be a complete waste of your time either way. But I really liked it. I was pleasantly surprised. It is the concept is by Tatsuya Endo. And then this novel was by Ava Yajima. And then it was translated by Casey Lowe. I liked it quite a bit. That's Spy Family Volume Portrait Prose Novella check it out and get your copies in for volume 11 coming soon excellent all right we're gonna welcome back eric to a club episode here welcome back what are you bringing to the table first uh your volume unless you're playing a trick on me again no nope, not playing a trick sorry about that i thought i unmuted it okay first one is an independent from uh, independent blood moon comics called haunted house a love story. So basically it starts out, it, the story is told from the house's point of view. For some reason, it, it doesn't explain how, but it remembers starting out as a tree. And it talks about how a man, Sebastian, built the house with his own two hands, designed it and everything. And somehow that managed to put a spirit into the home. So the home, it's alive and it's aware. And having been designed by this man, it finds that it's in love with him. He just, the man's name is Sebastian. He just, he is glad that the person's in, you know, living within him because every part of his being was designed by Sebastian. Um, turns out Sebastian, it, 
doesn't really go over what his illness is. I'm guessing it might be tuberculosis because he's coughing. There's blood in it, blood coming out from his coughs. It's, you know, it, it seems to be like more of a Victorian era where this would be happening. Well, maybe not Victorian. It, it, it It's in the United States, I think. But, so yeah, so the man... Sebastian, he's sick with consumption. He falls in, you know, he has a doctor who has to come by with lots of different treatments. And during this time, he falls in love with the doctor. But the house doesn't like that because he wants Sebastian for himself. So he he forces uh, the doctor to have hallucinations of the house. And as he's trying to escape, it just slams the door right on his arm, nearly breaking it. So we find that the house is, you know, though it loves Sebastian, it's malevolent towards anyone who, you know, might, um, you know, try to get between them. Also introduces another character. I don't exactly know who this guy is. The guy with the glasses, scarred up face. He just seems way too happy. He's introduced in this book. You don't get to know too much about him. But time goes on. And of course, this is tuberculosis before it could be treated properly. So Sebastian ends up dying in this issue. And they name these after like the stages of death or mourning. Chapter one is grief. And then currently it's on chapter two, which is denial. The house the house denies that Sebastian is dead. A new family moves in. And it does not like that they're in it there within the house. It uses its malevolence to control the family. It's just I don't want to give away too much because this is really like this is independent, but this is really a uh, a good read. So I mean, not a, a lot of horse horror stories. You know, they don't appeal to too many uh, readers. But this this one is really good because I don't know. It's just it's different because you get to hear it from the point of view of something that's supposed to be inanimate, but. But yeah, so I definitely think if you like the if you like weird haunted house stories, you know, the macabre, people's minds being taken over by, you know, ghostly presences, haunted house of love story is worth a read. Well, based on their review, uh, this might be a pleasant surprise to you, but the creator, Winston Gambro, was a guest on this very show. We we hey. had him last uh last fall, early winter or so. And uh, he had brought, uh, gave us access to issue one. We had read it. It's a six issue series. Uh, there are four of them out currently. I'm stockpiling them after I reread issue one, but uh, four of them are out cur currently. Two more to go. But yeah, he was. Uh, I've only gotten up to two. So huh. yeah, you gotta gotta seek out there. There's a couple more out there, and then um, I yeah, pre-ordered, so and I only got two of them too. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I double checked just to see how many were out, and uh, I have four of them scanned at the moment. So, well, how'd you get them? <laughs> uh, through legal means. Um, I forget which ones I got these because I've been jumping back and forth between online people. But, um, but yeah, January and February had issues. So, um, but yeah, he there's a creator episode where uh, we dive into uh, the creation of this as well as Winston's career. And then he joined us for a regular comic club episode right after it too. So if you want a little more backstory on there, um, Eric, check out our back catalog of this very show. I'll have to dang. And it's um, the fun, fun part about it is too. It's not, it's six issues, but it's not like an ongoing. I think you could read each in, issue individually because the way it looks, it's going to be a whole new layout with each one of them. Yes. So. Kind of, kind of like I want to say, compare it to the silver coin. It, each issue of the silver coin, you know, it as an anthology around the coin, but it was its own story. So, yeah, sort of in like an anthology format with probably overall connective tissue, but ultimately 
very yeah. separate if you were just happened to jump in here kind of like ice cream man and things like that yeah. where you just kind of had you know you jump in for the adventure so it's yeah the house, so <laughs> cool cool all right um and uh i'm next i was looking at the list being like all right um i'm the next person to talk i am here to talk about the next miniseries debut for ms marvel mutant menace hated and feared Ms. Marvel has officially come out to the world as a mutant and a member of the X-Men, and she's about to learn just how hard things can get for mutant kind. Kamala Khan is used to being a hometown hero. There's no way her community would turn on her just because she's a mutant, right? Right? The writers of the hit Ms. Marvel The New Mutant miniseries, including the MCU's own Kamala Khan, Aman Vellani, return to chronicle Ms. Marvel's next step into exploring her mutant identity. This comic is done by Aman Vellani, Samir Perzada, Scott Godlewski, Eric Arcianega, VCs Co- uh, Joe Caramagna. I was too worried about getting the other ones right, and then the one I've said more than any other name. Um, Tom Muller and Jay Bowen. Uh, this is the next little mini series. I read every Kamala Khan story uh, rather than having an ongoing because we've had one huge successful ongoing run and then i think there was like a mini one that kind of rebooted within there and then we had like started getting a couple mini series we've seen that over the years at least with marvel comics of uh some of these series kind of just getting like a, a trade paperback treatment of just like you know let's just guarantee these four or five issues release a trade paperback in a couple months we start another arc and just kind of do it that rather than you know go on to issue 17 and then it's canceled so this is one of those that i was happy to see get another round i really enjoyed it especially with having Amon Vellani, uh you know jumping from being a comic book fan and an mcu fan jumping into the mcu being an actress and then jumping into comics as a writer and actually writing the characters such a a unique experience for uh, someone so young and someone who's so full of knowledge with the Marvel universe, uh, getting to play with the X-Men, getting to play with Kamala Khan and the greater Marvel universe. This series is existing during the fall of X. Now I haven't been reading any of the other stuff. I think I talked about the Hellfire Gala. I've been following anything that Kamala has appeared in, in the main X-Men books. Um, But ultimately what I understand is that it's gotten to a point bunch of bad comic book stuff happened the the mutant population has kind of fled i don't know if they're out in space i think there's a group that's hidden down on earth because what i know from this context here is that kamala khan and a very small group of x-men we're talking i think psylocke's in there we've got wolverine we've got deadpool uh rogues in there and they're kind of living underground kamala khan is kind of dealing with um you know, the same troubles that she had before with being the hero of Jersey City, except this time around, Kamala Khan is now known to the public as a mutant. And Jersey City is divided on whether uh, whether they side with her or not. Now, she went from being an inhuman superhero that saved their city and was beloved. And, and now that she's kind of tied in with the X-Men and there's a lot of people that, you know, continuously fear the X-Men and think they're bad and and so with her just being a mutant having a new costume exploring her powers her powers are are kind of uh flickering they're kind of out of whack they're kind of uh you know there, there's a lot of mishap going on if she wants to do her in big and powers and stretchy hands and stretchy legs there's moments where she kind of has uh these spasms as they say where then her powers just kind of go out of whack in the middle of using them and so she's trying to be a big asset to the X-Men with being somebody who actually can kind of exist as Kamala Khan in the real world and still be out on the streets. Whereas all the other ones, they don't have secret identities. So they're ones that, you know, are living underground and stuff. And, um, and the X-Men are just like, well, you, you're still, you know, a high school girl, you go have a life, you got your friends, you got your family, we're taking care of this, but she wants to, you know, always help and, and, and once again, seeing in this story on where everybody inside Jersey City, on where they lie with uh, her thoughts, we see an interaction of her stopping a new mutant that's on the scene. 
and we see how that conflict goes down when the police are involved and we see a divide on uh, whether you know certain cops officers and everybody that are in the story that some are uh, on Ms. Marvel's side and some aren't. Uh, so we see that dynamic play out. It's been really fun. I, I like how that I'm still able to enjoy this without catching every chapter of the Fall of X saga. There's just a lot of X-Men books out there and I just haven't been reading as much in general um, in overall comics. And, uh, but yeah, this, I was happy to see this new mini series debut. I didn't really show too much, uh, stuff from the inside, but once again, we have uh, Deadpool in here, which is pretty fun. Cause I, I can't recall if Kamala has had any direct stories with Deadpool. Uh, Wolverine was one of her, like the biggest, like Marvel universe crossover into her very early books. I want to say like issue seven or eight, maybe of that initial run. And it's her kind of fangirling out over, you know, Wolverine being there and having a team up and everything. But it's fun to kind of see her mix it up with these other X-Men, as well as dealing with the everyday life Kamala Khan does. So I'm glad we still see that stuff because I think that her story about her family, her neighborhood, her friends and her school, all of that stuff, I think is very uh, important to uh, this character's stories very much like you know peter parker and his stories where you know yes he's spider-man but peter parker that's where a lot of the drama comes in and when you read those stories and i always felt that kamala khan was kind of a very like if you like those peter parker high school you know spider-man stories uh kamala khan i think is uh same kind of formula uh I really dig it. So yeah, this is another fun little debut. I think this is going for four issues, if I'm not mistaken. And happy to see Iman Vellani continue on writing comics and getting to explore more of the Marvel Universe beyond the silver screen and the TV screen, whatever you call that screen. So, all right, that is going to do it then for Ms. Marvel, Mutant Menace, issue number one. Kirby? All right, unlike the first thing I reviewed where a newbie ended up deciding to take over the world and control everything. In this one, we got Chaos Comics, six-issue run. I want to say 2014 for this. Uh, But in this one, you have Purgatory, our experienced demon (laughs) that's taking over everything and controlling everything with I mean, Hell's kind of trying to to do with the chassis, kind of like teaming up with Evil Ernie and stuff. But they're all all trying to control everything as usual. But this is nice because you get all your different characters from Dynamite. And this is Tim Seeley and Merc and El, El, Andelfo. We got an epic battle for the future and soul of the world unfolds. The vampire goddess Purgatory seeks to rule the world and have her revenge on her nemesis, Mistress Hell, who, along with her consort, Evil Ernie, aims to bring on Ragnarok. All the while, the Chosen, a group of supernatural mortals, prepare to face off against both goddesses as well as any manner of demons and mystical creatures to prevent a cavalcade of apocalypses from occurring on Earth. Welcome to humanity's fight for survival in the world of chaos. I I love Tim Seeley. <laughs> I buy almost all the stuff I can get my hands. I don't know if he was in a drug infused state during this run, but his writing is really weird in this, and a lot of it's off. And I don't don't know what was going on there, but this runs into the next thing I talked about, and that was written way better than this was. So I just don't know if he was going through a phase there or just pushed it out fast or something like that. But we get to see Purgatory controlling a bunch of people trying to hunt down Evil Ernie. They're trying to get him stopped because of all the stuff that happened in Evil Ernie Volume 1 basically led to the... the, I, I can't think of what it's called right now, but it's basically the destruction of the world where he just lit up las vegas and everything and destroyed everything and there's tons of dead walking around half the united states was uh overpowered by hell and they're trying to take everything over 
And I know I, I reviewed some stuff from that in the past, but this jumps in after those events and uh, Megadeth. That's what evil Ernie was trying to cause back then was Megadeth. And there, La- Lady Purgatory is basically, I mean, her, I forget her name's like Sam, I don't know, it's like Sam Hain, but it's not Sam Hain, uh, in here also that she prefers being called. But, uh, she's just given out tons of lies to try and get evil Ernie caught and taken out of the picture. But yet evil Ernie's only going after like rapists, murderers, pedophiles, all that killing them. Because every time he kills someone that's evilly killed someone in the past, when they die, he can see lady hell in their eyes and see purgatory and stuff. And see what's going on so he knows where his mission's going. So he's hunting down bad guys. And Chastity hunts him down trying to take him out and stuff. Until she realizes what's going on. So she joins up with Evil Ernie. And then they basically go to deal with the rest of the battle themselves. Because Evil Ernie gets in this moment early on where him and... Smiley, the the little happy face button character, had some things, and Ernie tosses him aside. Well, if you know anything about Evil Ernie, Smiley basically recharges Evil Ernie. He's his basically Green Lantern uh, <laughs> light thing recharger. So anytime Evil Ernie's low on his green bodily <laughs> mist type stuff that gives him all the powers to explode and do all kinds of things, control the dead and all that stuff. Evil Ernie can recharge him. But after he threw Evil Ernie out, that just left him at best door. If he, he just get weaker and weaker as he was getting attacked. And then he pretty much gets to the point where he's starting to turn to a skeleton and just about at his ends wits. And then uh, Evil Ernie eventually er, uh, catches up with smiley again and they rehook up but but yeah it's an interesting look at all our different characters you get there's a few characters in here i never knew before we have a, a variety of witches demons vampires werewolves again in this one also uh there's a group of four characters that are pretty well focused on sticking with purgatory and helping her out along the way or we basically got a demon the vampire uh necromancer and a a revenant which i don't know he just i don't know what he really is he's kind of like that voodoo type stuff he's using in there but again you're dealing with all the different factions working together to bring hell upon earth and cause all kinds of trouble and she's just playing with everybody's minds trying to turn them all against evil ernie so she can get the final control of everything in the long run and take over hell it's definitely a good look at all the characters and this flow of this because this again is a big event in the chaos universe this time in dynamite which crosses over with all the different character storylines uh, but this one's a little bit bigger than the Xenoscope one was, so I'm not sure as far how far it fully reaches, but I know every character has something to do with it. So, but yeah, I like the way this crossed over. I like like to see Chastity and Evil Ernie when they kind of team up a little bit, but this will lead into the next one that I'm going to talk about too. So. Okay. All right, it's time to take a trip uh, to a galaxy far, far away with Jedi Ambassador Katie. What you got for us? All right. This week I have Star Wars Legacy Volume 1 called Broken. Uh, This takes place 125 years uh, after Return of the Jedi. So all of our heroes are uh, now one with the Force. Uh, This book was released in 2006, and the protagonist is a man named Cade Skywalker. Uh, he was a, uh, Jedi Padawan. The temple on Asus got attacked by bad guys. 
and that whole experience makes him decide that he doesn't want to do anything Jedi or Sith or do anything with the Force anymore. So he ends up becoming kind of a pirate and a mercenary and a bounty hunter and teams up with some uh, less than savory folks. But of course, the Force, as always, is at work and nobody can stay away from it for very long. And he gets drawn back in to a conflict among uh, Jedi and Sith and uh the yuzan vong are are wrapped up in this a little bit somehow um and he ends up having to help rescue a beautiful princess from the imperial remnant and it ends up drawing him back into the jedi and deciding that he's going to he can't deny his heritage but he's definitely going to use it in his own way um the character Cade, he likes to get high on death sticks because he doesn't want to listen to Luke's force ghost um, talking to him, but because um, Luke is like a super force ghost, he still does anyway. And uh, pretty interesting interaction to see a uh, double great grandfather and grandson interacting with one another like that. Um, what else happens? So we get some cool battle scenes as always. This volume introduces Darth Talon who um, is a Sith Twi'lek who's like covered in tattoos and uh, she wears a very skimpy outfit. Originally, there was talk of her like being an apprentice to Darth Maul um, and possibly showing up in the sequel trilogy. As we know, that that didn't happen, but she is quite popular among fans and cosplayers and she comes from these comics. Um, what what else? I, I will say I'm not entirely sold on the choice to put her in a tube top and booty shorts. I googled it. The artist who designed her, Jan Dersema, is um well, for one thing, she's a lady, but she's worked on Star Wars quite a bit and she said her idea was she wanted to evoke the ancient Picts and Scots and Celts who would basically go into battle not wearing anything but like a loincloth and that they were trying to go for something more primitive and primal versus hey let's let's um have this girl in a very skimpy outfit to sell books <laughs> but i guess they both worked in her favor um if you are a big fan of the expanded universe as i am and you've read a lot of the books and comics i think you'll really really enjoy this um there's a lot of references and callbacks that assume that you have that knowledge if you haven't well, you might still be able to appreciate this as, you know, kind of like a Star Wars in the distant future. There's elements you're going to recognize, the Empire, the Sith, the Jedi. Um, it starts out a little bit disheartening because I'm like, after everything that these characters have gone through in this expanded universe, the Sith and Jedi are still fighting each other. But um, at one point in, well, several points, I suppose, but in a book I most recently read where Luke basically muses that there's no way to get rid of the dark side, that it's the flip side of the light side and that everyone has the capacity for both. So there will always be people who abuse the dark side or lean too much on the light side in the world. And that's why the Jedi are there is to balance out that bad stuff. So it makes sense in that regard. Um, kind of cool to see what the future of Star Wars looks like in this universe. This is the old EU. So um, just just for that reference if you're a big sequel trilogy fan you're going to be like what is this but <laughs> this is the old eu in case you're wondering um george lucas actually had um some input into some of this and then was even considering like i said using some of these characters in his version of the sequel trilogy before he sold the rights and i actually was pleasantly surprised by this i picked it up from the library the epic collections are a little harder to find right now for a reasonable price and I'm not that attached to it that I need to own it right now. But I really liked it. Um, one thing that they, they didn't point out is that the Imperial Princess um, and Cade, I think, are cousins a couple generations back. So I was a little like, how are they going to play this out? Is it going to be like a romantic thing? Are they going to be buddies? But it seems like it's going to just be neutral. And watching Cade go through the hero's journey in this book was quite satisfying. And I like that he's a bit of a rogue. Um, also nice to see the Yuuzhan Vong pack back up. They are, they're from the New Jedi Order books, which is a trip. Um, I am cautiously optimistic about this. I did enjoy it. I read it all in one sitting and I ordered uh, volume two and three to check it out. But I think it's a solid beginning. It does a lot of things right. 
Uh, it's by John Ostrander and Jan Dersema, who have been working on Star Wars books for years and years and years. They've worked together many times, and they've always put out a quality product. Um, it looks good. It's well written. It feels like the comics that I have read, and it's chock full of stuff for great big giant super nerds like me to enjoy. And um, yeah, I'm excited. Anyway, it has a lot of potential. That's Star Wars Legacy Volume 1, Broken. This was published by Dark Horse Comics. And if you are into the Epic Collections, they are available. That You could go and get Epic Collection uh, Volume 1 from Marvel in the Legacy line. Anyway, that's my review. And uh, don't do death sticks, kids. Check it out. See, I, I did have the one follow-up question. I, yeah. uh, it's sort of related, but um, yeah. do you want to buy some death sticks? No, you don't want to sell me death sticks. You want I don't to want to sell you death sticks. Your life. Oh, I want to go home and rethink my life. <laughs> oh wait i have to host the show too um <laughs> let's see here let's jump over to eric uh what do you have next All right next is uh wolverine it's issue 41 and it hasn't concluded yet uh the saber tooth war uh, it's interesting how you were talking about how many mutants were in hiding a lot of them had gone elsewhere well this is where this one uh picks up although I just say, opening the book, there's a scene which sets a tone for what you're dealing with in the series. It starts out, you see, you see Sabretooth, and he's attacking the X-Men, and you see that, I don't know how well you see right here, but Sabretooth has torn open Cyclops' face and said, Guess he's Biclops now. So, and yeah, it's very graphic. So you realize that this is this is not really the super family-friendly version of the X-Men that we've come to know. It even has parental advisory not for kids on it. So this might not be a secret, but Wolverine and Sabretooth have never really gotten along. And after... And when uh, Krakoa was established, mutants that could not abide by one of the laws of Krakoa, kill no human, were sent to an area called the Pit, which is kind of like a very hellish area to be in. Now, uh, you talked about Fall of X, there was the Hellfire Gala, where a lot of mutants were sent to an alternate dimension uh, some are still on Earth, and that's where this takes place. Uh, we find that Wolverine is in is in Ant or I believe Antarctica, in a base with Domino, uh, Sage, Black Tom, uh, Kid Omega, X twenty three, and another Wolverine, Aurora, and North Star, among others, and. And uh, you find out that the opening scene it wasn't it was uh, it was Earth six one six Sabretooth in a simulation being watched by many many other Sabretooths. There you find that there's uh, Captain America Sabretooth, a uh, chameleon like Sabretooth who's a shapeshifter. As well as a female saber tooth, and I have to, and I, and you know, after Katie talked about how, how there was, I think Darth Talon, how she had to be in a tube top and booty shorts. I'm like, okay, did we really need to have? Why is the female saber tooth like, you know, in the midriff with uh, cleavage exposed? Do, do, do we really need to have that just because it's the female saber tooth? Does Every she have other full Sith tattoos. No, no Sith tattoos. Then. Oh, okay. On on an un, on an unrelated note, uh, what issue number is that? <laughs> Forty one. Go, go ahead. But don't worry, you get to see her throughout more of the series too. So, if you're looking for weird werewolf woman cleavage, there you go. But anyway, so so Sabretooth has been using Orcus technology to gather up alternate versions of himself. And in many other areas where the saber tooths were, you know, like unruly or didn't want to be led, 
they were decapitated and similar to the Star Wars decraniated. And if you know what those are, you realize that's nightmare fuel. They have like a cap put on their neck. So that way they're pretty much, you know, on board with everything that Sabretooth is doing. Uh, so around the, this is around the time where it's like the day of Wolverine's birthday and they decide to attack this base. They rip apart and eat Kid Omega. And, you know, it's really, really fun. Again, fun for the whole family. And uh, they set their plan in motion. They start, att they attack the base. They, and, you know, they end up decimating some of the few mutants who are remaining. And now, basically, Wolverine is, like, picking up the pieces after this assault, trying to figure out what he needs to do to get back at these saber... Would you call them saber tooths or saber teeth now? That's a good question. But... But like I said, the story is still ongoing. There's still, even in the next May previews or the upcoming previews, they're still doing the Sabretooth War. And I just, I think this is a very, in, this is like a very interesting storyline for Wolverine because not only is it apparent, is it also incredibly violent and brutal, which would be very, very likely when you're dealing with people like Sabretooth and Wolverine, not just, you know, the whole X-Men cartoon series where you never see him stab another person with his claws. Yeah, you see him using his claws in ways that you'd see someone like Wolverine use their claws. So yeah, so this has been a really good storyline. Uh, you know, you only need to have some basic knowledge of what went down with uh, Krakoa in order to jump in on it, but it is, if you're a Wolverine fan, it is definitely a really good jumping point to get in here now. So, as long as you're not, as long as you're, you know, not squeamish about blood, graphics, violence, and Wolfwoman cleavage, you'll be fine. But yeah, this is, like I said, this, I, I don't often review many of the mainstream ones, but this, but this storyline so far has been worth it. So, look forward to its conclusion. Oh, cool. Yeah. When you said it's fun for the whole family, I'm just imagining an entire family like having like a Friday night game night instead of playing Monopoly or Scrabble and their, you know, charades. They're like, you know what? We're all going to have a copy of this issue and take turns, you know, assigning characters to everyone, you know, the parents and the kids and grandma gets to read the role too. And everybody just enjoys reading that comic. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that could work. All right. Like yeah. podcast. Exactly. It's a new tradition that I think uh, everyone's going to adapt uh, very soon now after seeing this. So, All right. Uh, we have one more uh, review in the lineup for the weekly reviews. So Kirby, take us home before we jump over to the news. All right. Before I jump into it, I got to mention, I also dealt with lots of perversions <laughs> in my chaos comics. And there was even one gal that I don't understand the concept behind it. But she had to get into her bra and panties, take her clothes off, and get to the bra and panties so she could go out and fight evil. It's like you couldn't leave your <laughs> pants on for that. <laughs> Would be more comfortable? What issues were there? Oh, <laughs> and they were more focused on that than the girl that walks out of a bar, falls face first on top of someone who is decapitated in their blood that's leaking all over them. She stands up and her clothes are perfectly clean and she goes on with her day <laughs> but let's focus on those other things she carries let's... like a clorox stick with her or whatever those things are magic eraser or something yeah <laughs> and spray blood be gone we got evil ernie number one through six this is volume two this follows up right after the chaos run takes us into where evil ernie is at after everybody's trying to wipe him out but Ernest Fairchild aka Evil Ernie died sacrificing himself to save the world from the vampire goddess known as Purgatory now returned to hell his master Lucifer's domain oh I suppose spoiler alert you get to hear what happened <laughs> yeah, that's with Evil Ernie there <laughs> master Lucifer's domain 
He experiences torture and condemnation on an hourly basis for the betrayal he committed to his master in assisting his beloved mistress, Hell, and her attempt to bring around Ragnarok. But you can't keep a good serial killer down, especially when there's a shot at redemption and earning the Prince of Darkness's good graces again. Evil Ernie's always been at the head late mistress's whim, just anything he can do to get her love. That's what he focuses on. Same with Lady Death. Uh, in this one, we got Ernie trying to get everything stopped. He's teams up with a girl that's just, she's not part of any of this. She's got to try and find out what's going on, why he's doing what he's doing, but yet because she kind of hooked up with evil Ernie, there's people hunting her down now too. So she's got no choice but to hang out with Ernie. So she's got some protection and stuff. This one goes towards the male side of <laughs> nudity and this one because we spend a, a lot of time in hell and there's lots of guys in here with no clothes on running around, but here you get to see a little bit of the hell realm while Ernie's being punished for everything. What issue numbers are the, oh wait, never mind. <laughs> One through six. <laughs> uh, but throughout this, they keep trying to stop everything that's going on with uh, Lady Hell, Mistress Hell, and what she's sending after him. Smiley and Ernie work together in this one. They don't separate up like they did in the last one. The girl ends up having well, the characters that are stalking her kind of got these like they're kind of demons. I'm not sure she's got like tentacles growing out of her stomach. And it's kind of like has that evil Ernie aspect where he's got the body where he's missing his stomach also, but his is filled with the nuclear green stuff. These this other gal, she's I don't know, she's kind of got like worms in her. I'm not really not sure how it works because at one point she even attacks well, evil Ernie punches her in the stomach. And when she does, her bugs just kind of crawl crawl into evil Ernie and kind of take over his body. He's got all these worms running through him, and he's getting weaker and weaker. But then he ends up using some liquid nitrogen to kill him off and save himself. And then that's how he goes after her. But, yeah, she's trying to take over hell he's trying to get his redemption through hell we get cremator in here uh a variety of hell's main controllers of certain realms and stuff that are they're all trying to take over the power from lady from mistress hell throughout here and ernie's just trying to save it because of his love for her and just how he, how Ernie works. He's always trying to protect the one that he cares about him. He's always looking for that person that's going to tell him what to do, send him on his way, give him his missions, put him through whatever they want to have done. He'll gladly do their uh, uh, <laughs> do their bidding for, for him. But it's it's a good follow-up from the Chaos storyline. I like this one a lot better. It dealt with a lot more. I like this. Like At one point, uh, one of the characters, Evil Ernie can raise the dead, but he comes across another character that's basically the girl that he picked up, her boyfriend, uh, Lady Hell, takes him under his, her control, gives him 
these supernatural powers and he's also able to raise the dead to a point but not as good as evil ernie he can't control stuff as much as evil ernie can but she has him that she made a lover she has a couple of the female characters that she made her lovers a couple other characters from hell and all these characters had a connection to her at one time and she sent them all after evil Ernie to take them out. And just cause she wanted to get evil Ernie back to her graces. And that was her way to do it. But this character that was the, our girl's boyfriend, he was given a special I mean, pretty much the same abilities as evil Ernie, but there's something with this purple mask and I can't give it away, but in the end it, something happens with it and it links someone else to it. And it's going to take us into the following storylines that come up after this, but yeah, it's, it's fun seeing evil Ernie try to stay at the top of the female's superiors graces and just deal with everybody else that's trying to take him out so they can get in her graces themselves but that's basically where the storyline went after purgatory was trying to destroy the whole world now we're dealing with hell trying to just send minions to bring evil back and just keep him keep him in hell where they think he belongs and so but yeah, this ends what well it leads they'll go into the whatever other stories they had after this, they'll end it all. And then we just recently got a brand new Evil Ernie run, which I mentioned, which takes us into a teenager in high school and he's the new Evil Ernie concept in the volume three of Evil Ernie. And it's a whole different it's such a big jump from this original evil Ernie storylines that I don't know, I couldn't quite fully enjoy it. I'll see where it goes eventually, but yeah, it's bringing us into a whole new world, starting with a teenage character again. So. Uh, Oh, and this also has, it's Tim Seeley, of course, but it has Steve Seeley in here also, and then Raphael Line Hellas. So. Cool, cool. Uh, my one question, because you're talking about the minions and everything, are these the universal minions like <laughs> Stuart, Bob, Kevin, or is this a different set of minions? No, these are the purple ones, not the yellow ones. <laughs> they like the plums, not the bananas. <laughs> Anthony, I have a quick update. Yes. So. Well, he's still more dressed than Darth Talon. There is a panel in here of Cade Skywalker barefoot for some unknown reason in a battle, kicking a Sith in the face. So, uh, yeah, I just thought that was a, a really fun detail. And still more dressed, but why would you go into battle barefoot? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so well, you, you think know, you want some armor. <laughs> well, when I was in Taekwondo, I did all my stuff barefoot so you know, maybe he just practiced barefoot so he's like hang on let me kick my shoes off so i can kick you better oh there we go you know that's a good point yeah that, I, we can roll with that i like that where there's a will there's a way all right that is going to do it then for the weekly reviews but we do have another segment which is the news and now the news Welcome to part one of two of our previews preview. We're going to go through the catalogs for uh, March for products coming out in May and beyond. We're going to start with Marvel Comics. Uh, Let's see what I got flagged over here. Now, we have a Deadpool and Wolverine movie coming out in July. Uh, I haven't been reading either of their titles, but when I see a miniseries coming out, uh, Deadpool and Wolverine World War III, number one, uh, I'm just like, you know what? I'm going to be in the mood by the time this comes out. We're gearing up for the movie. Two issues will be out, you know, by the time, maybe even the third by the time the movie comes out. So, yeah, I'm going to jump on board for this three issue miniseries, which I think others are probably interested in as well. But 
Uh, yeah, Deadpool, Wolverine, World War Three, number one. Jump over to Kirby. Yeah, I am definitely checking that out. And the only other one I had was Helverine, number one of four. Because you demanded it, the return of the Helverine, when a demonic force known as Bagra Ghoul first came to Earth, it brought Logan and Ghost Rider together to hunt it before it possessed Wolverine. But now, in the present day, what event will put the Helverine back on the streets? And is he slashing his Hellfire claws for good or evil? And introducing the all-new Hellfire Warriors. Yeah, something new for me to check out. <laughs> and then just to mention, since we have two for Deadpool and Wolverine, once we get if we get a third person, then we usher it into a club discussion. So I'm just throwing that out there. Uh, jump over to Katie. Uh, anything from Marvel? I also thought that Deadpool v. Wolverine uh, looked pretty promising. Cool. All right, so yeah, I think I'll uh, make a note of that here so I can post to everybody in the club because, uh, yeah, we're running a little low on some club discussions coming up, so this will be a nice little three-issue club discussion. We, I don't think we've ever covered these uh, outside of like any Marvel events, but yeah. so this will be a, a relatively new territory for us as a club discussion. All right, um, did you have anything else oh. that you want to mention? Oh, well, yeah, um... well, you know, I'm oh, sorry. Oh, you no, go. you're good. I, I have a couple that are maybes. Did you know they're doing another X-Men wedding special? I had to laugh when I saw that, but it looks like the wedding is actually happening this time. <laughs> I've got that tagged in here, but yeah, since you also had the Wolverine one, uh, feel free if you wanted to list another one at all, but unless that was the one you're listing. <laughs> or you're good. No, Eric, you can go ahead. Okay. Well, yeah, I'm also doing the Deadpool and Wolverine because I like them both and put them together. Just, you know, Wolverine's anger and Deadpool's constant antagonism. It's going to, it's going to be fun. I'm That stuff's going to get chopped off uh, Deadpool just so we can grow him back. But anyway, also, the only other one that I was looking at, of course, since this one's Frank Castle, it's uh, called Get Fury. 1971, there's a war raging in Vietnam, and Nick Fury has been captured by the Viet Cong. At this moment, they don't quite understand that they have in their possession a man who knows enough secrets to damage the United States beyond comprehension. CIA, however, does realize this, and they can't risk their enemy getting those secrets, so they dispatch the most deadly man in the U.S. Army, Lieutenant Frank Castle. So uh, this is bringing back Garth Ennis, who's one of my favorite Punisher writers. He did The Platoon and uh, The Punisher Soviet, which are really good. And one thing I like is that, you know, the main cover, it's kind of a throwback to the Amazing Spider-Man comic where he, where, you know, he came back where it's, it shows the Punisher and then the crosshair on one of the main characters. So, yeah, I mean, of course, it's Frank Castle and Garth Ennis, so I have to get this one. But, yeah, this is like the only new one that I can think of from Marvel that I'm getting. So... Cool, cool. Um, I just posted in the club for uh, those to know about the Deadpool Wolverine one. Uh, next one on my list here, uh, Katie had mentioned it, X-Men The Wedding Special number one, a wedding extravaganza. Uh, Mystique and Destiny are one of the most beloved and longest running gay couples in history. Somewhere in their 100 years together, the pair married but never seen the event on the page. So yeah, apparently it had happened, so we're looking back at this thing. Um, uh, so yeah, this is, uh, Mar this year's Marvel's Voices Pride makes history with Marvel's first woman to woman wedding and a story by superstar X-Men scribe Kieran Gillen. And with a couple as complex as these two, you know, there's a lot more to the story. Um, let's see here in the classic tradition of Fantastic Four annual number three and X-Men number 30, this anthology will be a must read for every comics fan and a lot of other information but it's a one shot um even though i have been reading you know x-men as i mentioned earlier uh these things are usually pretty fun i see carol's uh in attendance here on the cover there's a good chance kamala is going to be showing up there as part of the x-men family so yeah i will definitely be checking out now, i'm not going to be pre-ordering any cakes to be made 
um, like we did back in uh, the, the Crimson Call storefront days. Uh, but, you know, I will pick up X-Men The Wedding Special, number one. And was that everything, Kirby, then you had mentioned? For Marvel? Yeah, but yeah, me too. I was thinking about that. It's like I, I miss the wedding parties when a wedding special comes up. <laughs> All right, so that's two people for the wedding special officially. Um, no, I'm not getting the wedding special. Well, I, just, I just missed the wedding party at Crimson Collow and <laughs> at the comic shop. <laughs> Do you want to be invited to the uh, the app? What's the reception, but not the actual wedding? So yep, <laughs> fair enough. Um, and then just as I try to remember, Katie, did you have anything else for Marvel? I did. So I also thought that Get Fury looked promising, and then there were just a couple um, Star Wars covers that I thought looked cool. There's a uh, Qui Gon and Obi Wan, and then uh, Anakin and Ahsoka. They're always putting out covers that look really nice. Um, not currently reading either of those series, but yeah. So a couple cool covers over in Star Wars land and Get Fury looks promising. Uh, I thought Katie might have been picking it up or mentioning it, but uh, there is also that Star Wars Phantom Menace 25th yep. anniversary special coming also out. considering it. Yeah, it's a strong maybe. Yeah. I'm not a fan of episode one, but it sounded decent. Uh, and then Eric, that was everything on your side? Pretty much. The last one I was going to bring up was exactly that. The Star Wars Phantom Menace 25th Anniversary Special. Celebrating 25 years, explore the earliest days and secret inner life of Anakin Skywalker with never-before-seen uh, revelatory stories set before, after, and between the scenes of the movie. Um yeah, this is something I'm excited for. Uh, I enjoy the movie, and I see they're going to be uh, re-releasing it in theaters. And I uh, honestly, I'm down for it. So I've seen the movie many times. I'm I'm going to see it. Um, but yeah, this one shot special is coming out. So that I'll be Queen Amidala that. cover is gorgeous. Yeah, yeah. And I'll I'll kind of zoom in there a little bit there. But yeah, uh, yep, I'm down for that. So yeah, there's many more things in the Marvel catalog um, that we didn't cover. So we always recommend to uh, check out your local comic shop, ask for the Marvel previews catalog, go to your uh, preferred online retailers and check that out. We will jump over to DC. And since I just had one, once Kirby's done taking a drink there, I am buying time to kick it off over to him. Anything from DC? I have nothing in the DC catalog this week. I've got one sitting here, so we'll see if Katie picks it or not. Katie, anything? I also have nothing new from DC, but I'm open to some club picks from it. I haven't had one in a while. Okay, Eric, let's see. I have one tab here. Is this going to be what you're talking about? Doubtful, because I really don't see anything new in the DC previews that are you know, picking my interest. So, sorry to be a broken record, but... That's all right. So I, I will kick it off here at the DC catalog with uh, one pick here, something I actually own all the issues for. So essentially, I don't have any picks, but I am going to spotlight Supergirl Woman of Tomorrow, the deluxe edition. This is by uh, done by Tom King and Bill Quist Evely. This was an awesome series, very standalone from all continuity. You know, it, it didn't it, it was such an awesome story. I picked it up issue by issue. And it is strong influence of what's going to be happening in the, the upcoming uh, DC universe that is being helmed by uh, James Gunn. And I know Tom King has been working behind the scenes and working on some, you know, projects and stuff. I don't know if he's officially attached to this, but I wouldn't be surprised if he has some creative input on the, the script for this. They have cast the actress for it. Um, I don't know the name offhand, but she was the in the recent uh, the Game of Thrones prequel series, like the Targaryen that's in there. Um, she's the, you know, she's the Daenerys, but not the Daenerys because she's the one that came before or something. But um, that actress is playing um, and uh, I almost just had her name there, but uh, she is going to be starring as the new uh, Cara Danvers in the DC universe with the Supergirl uh, Woman of Tomorrow, which I think is the official title of the movie. At least it is upon script announcement. Um, those things always change. But uh, this was an awesome collection. It has some extra stuff here. And there's a good chance I think I'm going to double dip for this hardcover. So that is a, it's a $50 re retail price. 
online discounts applied, 264 pages, hardcover, uh, awesome, awesome story. So I'm going to pick up Supergirl, Woman of Tomorrow. And and I'll just name drop this one. I think in the last catalog or the one before, you know, we always see the Looney Tunes issues advertised in here. I think Katie has mentioned them a couple times, you know, when we've gone through always the catalogs. Fun. Yeah. And uh, I think it was maybe two months ago when I'm just like, I should start getting these. So I, I've i been now adding them to my list. I'm waiting for my first one to show up. It's like issue, like what, 270 something probably. 278. But um, I figured uh, I figured I'm going to pick up some Looney Tunes and I figured it might be a fun little thing since I'm not getting much from the DC catalog. This is one of the books that's still at the two ninety nine price, and uh, yeah, I uh, I always look at the Looney Tunes also because I pick up the ones I really enjoy. Same with Batman and Scooby Doo Mysteries. I followed the whole first volume, second volume. I bought about half of them, but I am getting this next one, number five, because it just happens to have Man Bat in it, and I love that cover. So it's like, what the heck? I'll pick that one up. <laughs> They're always fun. Yeah, it looks like a it looks like a good one. All right, well that'll do it for DC catalog. Uh, once again, we barely covered uh, anything in here. I will say the cover. I I was curious about this one. It's the Boy Wonder. It's the cover treatment here, written and drawn by a visionary creator, uh, maybe Uni Ba, possibly is how you pronounce it. Looking at the art style is very unique. I'm not familiar with their work, but you see some examples on the inside and i definitely love that cover and then just kind of the style yep kirby's showing it there as well yeah and, those pages i'm not a boy for wonder fan but the pages had me almost thinking about at least checking out an issue <laughs> it is damian wayne too for people wondering if uh, people didn't read into it i know that could be a you know a plus or a negative. downfall <laughs> um but I, I will just shout that out because i was really kind of taken aback by the that cover and just being like, Oh, it looks like, and I think it's like a black label. It's its own thing. So uh, yeah. that's what I really dig about black label uh, books over at DC is just uh, really letting those creators do what they want and kind of do their own thing without being, you know, weighed down by continuity and fitting into events and stuff. So and the black labels I have checked out with characters I'm not big on. I've really enjoyed. So. But yeah, check out the DC catalogs and uh, pre-order the comics. So that is going to be everything. In our next available episode, we will do the giant catalog, which is the uh, independent publishers, the merchandise, the apparel, the collectibles, and all of that fun stuff. And uh, yeah, so that is going to wrap it up for the previous preview, wrap it up for the news segment, and start to wrap it up for the show as we just cover some quick plugs here. At the time of this recording, it is one day away from the uh, Comic Verse event in Nina that I will be uh, setting up a table for to sell my art. And by the time this episode is released, it will be over. So I'm just going to give a you know preemptive uh, you know thank you to everybody who showed up and you know gave me a million dollars for my little art sketches. Um, so yep, it was super successful. I'll talk about how it really went later on when I actually experienced the event. But if you want to catch an event that is uh, that you didn't miss, then you can mark your calendars for Sunday, uh, May 5th, which is Madison Mighty Con. Sunday, May 5th is M Madison Mighty Con. Myself and at least one of the Davids, if not both Davids, will be in attendance as we'll have our art tables and they'll be selling their comic book and leftover merchandise from the storefront and such. I'm always adding new art. We're all adding new art to our uh to our portfolios and stuff to sell. So go to MightyConShows.com for tickets and information on that. Uh, one cool thing that kind of happened is that, you know, we booked this event uh, back in February, I believe, and looking at it, it's free comic book day weekend. And I'm like, well, I'm like, oh, shoot, it's the same weekend. Usually I go to, oh, yeah, Comics and Skokie. But I'm like, oh, MightyCon is on a Sunday. Perfect. So I can go to Skokie on Saturday for the release of the Dr. Seuss book. I'm going to reach out to Art shortly to uh you know see if he wants to come on the crimson cowl to talk about cat in the hat coming out um and uh then i'm like all right i'll do skokie on saturday i'll jump to madison mighty con on sunday and then manager joe from uh, oh yeah comics reached out asking if i wanted to set up an art table on sunday may 5th at oh yeah comics and skokie 
because they do you know they get some like local creators and such and i'm like man i actually have to turn you down like it sucked to have to turn down that offer but also it's like oh man i'm yeah i'm i'm in demand that weekend but um but yeah that was one kind of bummer where i'm like oh man that would have been cool but we talked about it I'd be like well we'll just have to do it next time so so look for that in sometime in the future of me tabling at oh yeah comics in beautiful downtown skokie but the place that you can catch me at will be Madison Mighty Con along with the Davids. Uh, CrimsonCowell.com for information and original web comics. Crimson Cowell Comic Club on iTunes for the audio version. Subscribe, rate, and review, please. And then we have the Crimson Cowell Comic Club on YouTube. If you are listening to the audio version and you want some of the visuals and the show and tell and the things that we're doing, maybe some of the, the jokes that we're doing where somebody ran off camera, uh, you know, you can only see that by subscribing to the YouTube version, Crimson Call Comic Club on YouTube. Subscribe, like, comment, and share with a friend. Uh, Kirby has a spinoff podcast called Under the Cowl of MS. Is there anything you want to talk about that just came out or things on the horizon for Under the Cowl? Uh, I just recently finished up all my individual Milwaukee Mighty Con reviews, so I'm getting back to normal comic book reviews. Then we got some things that I, by the time you get this episode, I might have a new episode of something different out that I'm going to play around with. So we're, you'll have to see what happens. Just keep an eye out. But yeah, lots of reviews, lots of previews, some more fun unpackings. Like Anthony said, we had some original artwork and stuff recently also. That was a lot of fun. So check those out also. Excellent. So yes, yeah, subscribe to Under the Color of MS wherever you get your podcast, as well as Instagram and YouTube. I have some artist accounts over on Instagram and Facebook, Anthony Latch, L-A-A-T-S-C-H. Uh, I've been posting just some, some random stuff outside of my normal series, but I will mention that I have um, a series of gnome cards that I will be posting shortly because I, uh, as of uh, Monday, March 11th, so by the time people hear this episode, uh, they'll be back open for business, but a local shop here uh, is the Gift Nook, and I am going to have a vendor spot at the Gift Nook uh, here in town, and um, I drew some uh, cards specifically uh, to their theme of gnomes, fantasy, dragons, wizards, and things like that. Um, they have a lot of awesome stuff from local artists and crafters. Uh, stuff that is uh, whether it's nerd theme whether it's the stuff I just mentioned whether it's superheroes you know they'll have some like local sports stuff and everything and just a lot of cool cool stuff so check out the gift nook if you are local to us and if you're visiting Wisconsin search the gift nook out and uh, so yeah starting Monday March 11th I'm gonna have my all of my digital art prints available to purchase there as well as original sketch cards so that is cool and um, nice. and with upcoming movies for new Ghostbusters and Kong and Godzilla, I have some upcoming awesome art that I'm already drawing to post in coming weeks for the end of March. So you can see that on my artist accounts over on Facebook and Instagram. And I also host Cartoonist by Night um, over on YouTube. Uh, myself, Troy Dungara, Matt Fife, Matt Rogers, D. Brad Gibson has been joining us. And we just uh, had... Uh, Chicago artist Alejandro Rosado. We just posted that episode um, a week ago at the time that you are hearing this. Uh, Alejandro is the creator of Alley Cat. He is a Chicago artist and art teacher. He is part of the Oya oh yeah Comics family and he's uh, you know done a lot of stories within Oya oh yeah Comics, a lot of his own stuff. Uh, you can find out all about him by subscribing to Cartoonist by Night over on YouTube, a drawing show where we hang out and uh, you'll see some of those gnome cards being drawn on there too. But uh, Alejandro is a good hang. He's very inspirational. He's such a champion for people making their own stuff. And uh, it, it was such an awesome hang and to get to know him a little better. And uh, yeah, so check out Cartoonist by Night. We are almost done um, locking in our next big All Yeah Comics related guest. So I'm just going to be checking in on Monday to uh, confirm the final date on that. So a lot of fun stuff happening over there. That is going to do it for this episode. Thank you all for watching. Once again, it was great to have uh, Eric back as well as the cat. 
You won't be able to hear that cat if you're listening to the audio version, but you can see that cat by subscribing to us on YouTube. So once again, thank you for uh, uh, joining us here. Tell a friend, have fun. This whole time, I became a human turtle to protect myself. I've been causing absolute mega death with Smiley, the psychotic button. I've been barefoot kicking a Sith in the face. I've been non-consensually cuddling my kitty. To be continued. Hold for QR audience. Come on, QR audience. Take out those phones. I'm doing an unprecedented extra long outro just so you can take out your phone and go to Happy Wolf Art. If you're just listening to this, subscribe to us on YouTube. Okay, bye.